Oh, an error occurred. Oh, what the hell is going on here? Uh, oh, there we go. We're live. Okay, cool. I think <clears throat> we are live. I can't see how many viewers. Once again, I do not understand how this works. Okay. Uh, this happened last time as well. Um, but now I have no excuses. So. Uh, nice. So, everyone, if you are in this stream and you're watching the stream, I would really appreciate if you would drop a comment, let us know where you're from, and just to let us know if there's anybody actually watching this. So, um, yeah. Hopefully, there are people here who will drop some comments and ask some questions. Um, today, we're going to be talking about generative AI, .NET, C Sharp, and how all that uh, relates. Oh, we have someone here who's commenting. Great. OK. So there are some people who are on the stream. That's always good to know. Uh, so we've got someone from Seattle. Um, and then, you know, we are in a very global stream today. So we've got, uh, I'm in Seattle as well, by the way. Uh, Shai is in Berlin and Luis is in New York City. So very global presenter audience and a very global audience as well. There's someone from Indianapolis here. Um, and uh, yeah, so today, guys, we're going to be talking about Gen AI, vector databases, and .NET. So if you guys have experience with .NET, if you guys have experience with C Sharp, we'd also love to know. Um, I think this is very much a uh, dark horse in this area. Not a lot of, there are a lot of .NET developers, of course, um, but uh, there's not a lot of buzz around uh, .NET and Gen AI yet. And so we're hoping to kind of make some noise, make some buzz around that, lead the charge. And um, yeah, so Luis and Shai are here to present about that. And I will let uh, them take it away and introduce themselves. And then Luis will have a presentation to go through and uh, some demos and Shai will also talk a bit about uh, the demos and um, uh, how he's built uh, with uh, .NET and vector databases. So Luis, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for that intro. Uh, definitely a, a challenge, um, especially if folks are not familiar with .NET. Um, but my name is Luis. I am a uh, data, the data and AI PM uh, at Microsoft, specifically focused on the .NET uh, ecosystem, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, specifically in this role, I've been more or less for the past, uh, you know, five years or so, I've been in the space, uh, specifically working with .NET, but prior to that, also was involved in AI and doing some consulting there uh, as well. So, um, yeah, again, uh, really, really enjoy the space. And, you know, really the main thing, at least for me, is just, you know, helping developers really get access to, you know, whether it's their data or the models or anything that's related to these workflows, right? Making sure that it's a relatively smooth experience to do so. And so, yeah, we'll be showing you a few things today, but in the meantime, I'll just uh, hand it over to Shai. Yep. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shai. Uh, I'm an engineer, so I write code like every day for, for a living and so on. I basically work on everything related to data access and databases in .NET. So if you're accessing uh, even like a traditional SQL database in .NET, then you're, you're basically doing it through components that I work on, both high-level ORM stuff and low-level, uh, you know, uh, SQL, uh, SQL APIs, a uh, very wide breadth of databases as well from, uh, you know, SQL Server, which is the more traditional Microsoft choice, to Postgres open source databases and many, many, many things. And basically anything touching on data is something I'm interested in and kind of have my my fingers in. Uh, and I'm specifically here because I did most of the work. So the, the Melvis SDK 4.NET was uh, started as a community thing that I, I did not start it. But I, at some point, uh, um, you know, uh, did a lot of the work to bring it, you know, to make it, let's say, production ready and so on. So I, you could say I, I wrote most of it, basically. And yeah, I'm very excited to be talking to you about it. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for those intros, guys. Um, so we're really excited to hear what uh, you guys have to talk to, to, to say about this today. Uh, Luis, I'm going to bring your uh, presentation up and uh, we'll get started. Sweet. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to try to get through this as fast as possible um, because nobody's here for the slides and you all just want to see the code. Um, <clears throat> as I sort of mentioned earlier, right, if you are new to .NET or have never heard of .NET, um, right, basically it's a unified development platform where you can really build, you know, whatever it is that you want, right? And so like whether it's cloud applications or web applications with, you know, sort of UI frameworks like Blazor or on the back end, maybe you're using ASP.NET Core, right? You can build these types of experiences. 
um, whether you're working with desktop and mobile, right? You have uh, you know frameworks and ecosystems like Maui, right, that enable you to build uh, mobile mobile applications as well as desktop. On the gaming front, right, you have uh, uh, sort of engines like Unity as well as Godot, right, that really let you sort of build those types of applications as well as IoT type of applications. And then last but not least, right, AI applications. And there's a ton of sort of, you know, uh, libraries and frameworks in the .NET ecosystem, right, um, that enable you to, to build these types of applications. And now with generative AI, right, that, that list just continues to grow. Um, you know, one that's actually not listed here, but I would consider it part of AI is data, which is what we're going to be talking about here, right? But, and, and honestly, like data even goes across all of these, right? Because ultimately, you know, whether it's mobile, whether it's, uh, you know, web apps, cloud apps, right? You're going to need data to, to sort of, you know, actually make those apps usable and relevant to whoever's you know, using them, right? And so that's one of those cross-cutting concerns that if you are building data applications, right, .NET is also a, a good place for that. And so it's not only about sort of the types of applications that you can build, the frameworks and the libraries, but it's also about the tooling, right? And, and you know, the IDEs and the tools that you're using to build these types of products um, or any of these applications, right? And so you have things like Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, which I'm going to be uh, sort of working on uh, later, right? Uh, and, and showing the demos in. Um, .NET, um, commonly you hear it say it's Windows only. It's actually not. <laughs> it's it's cross-platform, so you can run on Windows, Linux, Mac, so a lot of platforms. You can run on ARM devices even, right? Um, so really the where you can run .NET applications, right, is really a, a wide set of devices, right, and, and platforms. Yeah, and then it, you get, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, it's always good to uh, to combat this old stereotype, which used to be true, which is that, you know, .NET was all about uh, Windows and Windows technologies. And, you know, coming from a data perspective, uh, you know, only supported the, the Microsoft SQL Server database and all that kind of stuff. And that was true at some point, uh, but that has shifted a long time ago already with, uh, you know, the .NET Core initiative. And a lot of people out there still think that they have to use Windows in order to do .NET. And that is absolutely not the case. And tons of, of people are, you know, developing on Linux. Linux. I personally use Linux and Mac. I almost never use Windows, and I'm a, I spend you know my days working on .NET all the time. So that's something that's a shift that people have to go through at some point. Uh, yeah, no, no, yeah, that's 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 spot on. Um, and actually, I will be working in Linux uh, as as I'm showing the demos, right? Um, and I think it's actually been ten years at this point that .NET, at least core, right, has been around. So yeah, almost, yeah, almost, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the ecosystem, right? Like, so from an ecosystem perspective, NuGet, you can think of it like you know PIP or you know NPM, right? It's sort of the way that you uh, manage artifacts and libraries and packages. GitHub, we all you know, know and love GitHub uh, for our source code. And then you know there's additional tools, libraries, so on and so forth. And the way that you program these types of applications and build these, you know, uh, these solutions is going to be in programming languages like .NET, uh, sorry, like C Sharp, F Sharp, and and so on, right? Um, so, but enough about .NET, right? Um, that was just a quick intro for folks who are not familiar. Let me kind of move on to what's we're actually here to talk about, which is AI and ML. Now, I'm not going to really bore you with this slide. It's just again, right, level setting. What can you do with AI and ML? You can do tons, right? And this is just a few examples. Lately, you've seen a whole wave of, you know, at least for, you know, for Microsoft, you've seen a whole bunch of wave of co-pilots, uh, whether that's in Office or any other other places, right? But there are other solutions that you can build, uh, right? It's not just chatbots and it's not just, um, you know, these assistants, right? And so it just gives you a general good idea. And later on in the demos, right, I'd be working mostly with recommendations with which, you know, vector databases are, are actually really nice for those types of, um, you know, sort, sort of solutions there. What's probably more interesting is like, okay, well, great, but how as .NET developers, what's available for you to go and build, you know, AI applications? And so uh, in terms of services, right, these are just a few, right? It's not exhaustive, but on the Azure platform, you have things like OpenAI and Azure AI services. But of course, you know, if you can call a REST endpoint, you should be able to use that service, right, uh, from .NET. Um, you also have frameworks and libraries, right? So you have Semantic Kernel, which helps you connect the different components, whether that's vector databases, whether that's, um, you know, uh, uh, LLMs or language models or any sort of service, right, really, that that is using either chat completions or you know, that's that type of um, interaction. Um, Semantic Kernel is actually something that you can use for that. Um, then you have uh, things like ML.net and AutoML, um, right? And so those are the things that we don't talk about anymore right it's an it's an llm world we're all living in an llm world nowadays but you know in yesteryear 
uh, you used to build models with, you know, different algorithms, whether it was, you know, uh, you know, tree based algorithms, whether it was clustering, right? There were these other techniques that you use for, for building these, uh, these types of models, machine learning models, right? And, and one of the things that ML.NET does is it provides you with a framework. One, it has automated machine learning, but also it lets you tap into other frameworks. Like, so for example, Torch Sharp, that's a set of .NET bindings for uh, LibTorch, right? That's what PyTorch is built on top of. So if you wanted to go and build and, and you know, sort of uh, train your own sort of neural network from scratch, that's certainly possible with Torch Sharp. The Sharp community is actually really great. There's some of the, the folks behind uh, projects like TensorFlow.NET, which similar to Torch Sharp, that's a set of .NET bindings for the tens for TensorFlow. Um, we have Onyx, right, which folks who are in the AI space may be already familiar with. Um, Plotly.net, right, if you do any sort of visualizations, you're going to probably be using something like Plotly or some sort of similar visualization library. Um, and then there's tools, right? So Model Builder, MLNet, CLI, those are for working specifically with ML.NET, but you also have things like Polyglot Notebooks, which I'm going to be showing a little bit later in the demos. And that's basically, if you're familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, Polyglot should feel fairly familiar with, you know, additional extensibility and Polyglot capabilities. Um, so with that, um, we're also we're not only going to be talking AI, but we're also going to be talking data. And so in that context, I'm just going to kind of hand it off to Shai here to talk a little bit about this. So like, like Luis, I'm going to try to breeze through this as quickly as possible to get to the code uh, very, very quickly. Oop, uh, can, can you uh, share? It? Let's let's remain on your slide, uh, Luis. Yeah, that, that's going to be easier instead of going back and forth. Yeah, that's that's easiest. So um, just a very quick kind of overview overview. If you're in .NET and you're using data, then uh, so the, the traditional kind of data thing, if you're connecting, for example, to a to a relational database, uh, then you're definitely using the majority uh, of, of users of .NET use an ORM called Entity Framework Core. Uh, one of the interesting things about it, it's uh, so it's not just an ORM for relational databases. It also supports NoSQL databases, so you can use the you can connect to databases like Mongo and, and document databases, and you've got like the same sort of pattern. So that's that's kind of like a cool thing. And another thing that's a little bit unique to .NET, which I find super cool, um, is that .NET has something called link, which means that you can basically use normal C# -sharp code to express your queries against the database. And um, EF Core, uh, the link provider, will translate those to SQL or to whatever is needed. So you don't actually need to learn SQL. You can express very very complex things and and you know in the normal way that you just do C# -sharp code. And that's a pretty cool thing that .NET has to offer offer in terms of data access. Uh, but that's one thing. So that's if you want like a, the full blown kind of o ORM. And that's that's a thing I work on like most of my days. And then of course, you've got like lighter and more low level kind of things. There's something called Dapper, which is what's called the row mapper, uh, where you write your own SQL, but get, get the row mapped materialized back you can use directly uh, system data which is basically like the uh the java jdbc of the dotnet world so the low level um api for interacting with sql database there's a whole load of you know products and data access layers and orms that you can use so it's a pretty vibrant ecosystem uh, uh lots of choices and of course now to, to the part which we really care about of course vector databases which is sort of i mean vector databases are not really new per se but of course they, they're getting a lot of attention recently with the whole gen AI. I think uh, and and where they interact with that space um, so vector databases are now extremely important and sdks and good uh, you know support for these from .NET is extremely important that's what we're here to talk about so let, let's go on to the next slide um, which is starting to dive into actually into Milvus. So now um, I'm assuming uh, like some very basic, uh, uh, you know, uh, familiarity with what a vector database is. I'm not, I'm not explaining that, but you're going to see actual demos and what Luis does uh, a bit later. Here, I'll just uh, skip forward. So the main thing that, of course, you need to support something like Milvus is an SDK. So that's basically, um, you know, a package. There's a NuGet package. It doesn't matter. There's a package in .NET, which you, you use, you, you put into your project, and then you can use that to, uh, you know, query the uh, Milvus given you know you give it uh, um, an, an embedding or a vector of, of numbers and then you get back other vectors which are similar to that thing along with their metadata and so on and so forth so all that is exposed via dotnet api and that uh, sdk is of course the first thing that everybody wants right if you don't have that you can't really interact with your with your vec vector um, um, database right but then there's other things that i just want people to keep in mind i think we'll be uh, concentrating a lot on the sdk but but there's also other stuff in the in the general package of, of you know what what's the 
there. So uh, Luis briefly mentioned uh, Semantic Kernel uh, before, which is a sort of, you can think about it as an SDK or as a stack of components for building, uh, you know, AI applications and, 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 and chatbots and things like this. Uh, that involves, you know, bringing together many tools. It's like an orchestration kind of thing. It's not just one, it's not just, you know, one component to build a full AI application. So Semantic Kernel kind of fulfills that need. And inside that, within that, a vector database is one piece of that puzzle, which you want to integrate into your AI application. And Milvus is an implementation. So here, one, ex one interesting example is that Semantic Kernel has a sort of abstraction for vector databases where Milvus is one, but there are others. And there's, there's that abstraction. And what we've also built is an implementation of that abstraction so that the Milvus SDK can be plugged into those applications very easily. That is built on top of the Milvus SDK that's on the first line here, right? So you've got a stack basically of Milvus support. Either you go for the low level like SDK and you're talking directly and you're not using any abstraction or anything. It's literally something that works against Milvus and is tailored to for working against Milvus. Or you go a bit more high level and you use something like Semantic Kernel, which integrates your, you know, Milvus into a larger kind of application and so on. And you're working at a different level. Uh, smaller things, uh, for example, there's a test container thing. And for people who don't know, test containers are awesome. They're basically a way for you to spin up um, a database like Milvus or any other service that you need for your tests. So you're writing integration tests. Um, and instead of, uh, you know, once you need your application needs to contact the database, then test containers make it super easy to test against Milvus when running your tests in CI or locally or whatever. So we've got you covered here as well uh, where Milvus is concerned. So that's there. And there's plans for additional things. So I'm not going to talk about this a lot. .NET Aspire, uh, Milvus component Aspire is, is, a, is a new way that's still in preview for developing cloud native applications in, in .NET. And that is super awesome. It just wires everything together for you and everything just, just works out of the box. It's super cool. Let's let's go on. I've got one more slide, and then I think I think we're diving into uh, into the actual um, um, you know code and so on. So just a few words about the Milvus SDK story itself, which again I worked on a lot. So uh, you've got an SDK today; <coughs> it's still considered in preview, so it's not officially like supposed supposed to be um, you know um, uh, release release or whatever. But that's okay; it, uh, it is in general very very stable, and you can use it. And we're very much looking for feedback to bring it. The plan is to bring it to um, you know to full like out out of of, you know, preview very, very soon. Um, it supports, I've done work recently, it supports the latest um, uh, versions of Milvus, so 2.3x. Um, it's fully tested in CI, so everything is stable and we know about regressions and so on. The driver, and, and there's work already started for the upcoming 2.4 RC of Milvus, so that's, that's something that we've got on our radar. Some features are already done, and I, I would expect in the coming weeks to have at least a first version for 2.4. In the meantime, you can already use it with 2.4. It's just that the new APIs are not necessarily covered via the SDK yet, so the new 2.4 features. Breezing through, so the SDK is fully gRPC only for optimal performance. So Milvus uh, at a lower level supports either gRPC or REST. So via, you know, HTTP without uh, gRPC, just via um, traditional REST. Um, the SDK is only, uh, um, you know, constructed above uh, gRPC. So it's very, very fast. It's 100% asynchronous IO. So there's no blocking of threads against, again, for very good scalability. If you're integrating the Milvus SDK into your web application, for example, and there's a lot of scalability and lots of users coming in at the same time. Generally, you don't want to block threads. Uh, I'm not going to go into this too much. The modern way is usually to do um, as asynchronous IO, and the, uh, the SDK is 100% async IO, so that's that's pretty good. Uh, a few words on how it, it actually is built. So those of you who know how gRPC works, gRPC leverages a technology called protobuf, where uh, there's contracts that describe basically the, the, you know, the types and the protocol and in and, and protobuf, and then you can generate um, um, you know, that into code for whatever language you want. So you can take the Milvus protobuf definitions and say, generate Python classes out of that or generate .NET classes out of that. And you just get that, right? So in theory, you don't even need an SDK. You just can use that thing to communicate with Milvus. And that is actually true. And that, that's a super cool thing with gRPC and protobuf. However, what you get out of that is usually not a very, very high quality experience in terms of uh, getting a nice idiomatic, you know, hand curated kind of designed API. You're going to get something that's a bit machine generated and it's not going to look 
nice. It's not gonna, if you're a dotnet developer, it's not gonna feel good, right? So the idea here was to provide the absolute best experience possible to the dotnet developer, which mean which meant taking that that stuff that's generated and wrapping it with a hand curated kind of experience, which we know which we can ensure is the best possible thing. There's various corners, just as an example. Rather, uh, in some cases, for example, the Milvis gRPC stuff will generate an error code, but in .NET, you don't want error codes, you want exceptions. So, uh, you know, we do that kind of translation of error codes into exceptions. There's full documentation that shows up in the IDE. Uh, we've in integrated logging, uh, like .NET native kind of logging into, so as you're using the SDK, you can get, if you want, you can get logs with varying levels. That obviously is not something you get for free uh, when you use the auto-generated thing. That's something you have to build in manually. So these are some reasons why we went with this approach where we're in completely in control of what the SDK looks like. Uh, of course, we do leverage protobuf and gRPC internally, but you don't care about all that stuff. That's internal implementation stuff. What you get is something that feels and behaves like a first-class kind of .NET API. So what I'm trying to say is basically we've got you covered if you want to use Milvis from .NET. And we're very much looking, I, I, I'm very much looking forward to seeing more uh, feedback from people about their experience, possible bugs, um, and et cetera, et cetera. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Back to you, Luis. Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Maybe uh, I didn't include that, but maybe that's something that we should uh, provide folks with, which is the link to the repo where they can oh, yeah. provide this feedback. Uh, and just follow issues. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that yeah. probably should have been a part of the links. Uh, but yeah, we can share those. I, I uh, agree. Let's see. All right. Let me let me just get out of PowerPoint. So finally, let's get into some demos. Okay. Out of PowerPoint. <laughs> um, let's see here. Okay. So the scenario that I'm basically going to be going over is uh, basically using some data. You can think of IMDb. This is movie data, right? And and doing something with that. And in this case, we're going to just be building a, a a movie recommendation sort of service here, right? Um, and what I'm in here right now is you're going to notice that there's this I, IPYNB extension, which should be fairly familiar to to folks um, who. Uh, you know, have been have worked with uh, notebooks before, right? Um, the difference is that in this case, I am actually using. If I can find my extensions here, uh, buh, 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 where are you, the container? Uh, I'm actually using Polyglot Notebooks, right? And so Polyglot Notebooks, it's an extension um, that builds on top of this uh, sort of you know, protocol and engine known as .NET Interactive. And as the name kind of suggests, right, you can use multiple different languages inside of the same notebook. So uh, while it's still following a lot of the same sort of, you know, uh, IPI and B, and you can certainly use, uh, you know, Jupyter, uh, you can use polyglot notebooks, right, with Jupyter, right, um, and get a lot of the, the functionality here, like, uh, you know, how, how it displays in GitHub and, and all those sorts of things around the ecosystem that are already there, right? This sort of kind of builds on top of that and, and sort of, you know, uh, provides additional language. And the additional languages in this case are going to be things like C Sharp, uh, F sharp, but also there's JavaScript, there's uh, PowerShell. If you want to run PowerShell scripts through this, you certainly can as well. And so, really, you don't, you know, in your notebook, you can kind of do a lot of the things that you would otherwise do in other places, right? Um, I'm also inside of a dev container, um, and so that I, that could be a whole talk on its own. Um, I really enjoy uh, dev containers. Note that they are different from test containers, the ones that uh, Shai mentioned, but the concept is, you know, more or less the same. And in this case, the dev container, what I'm doing here is I'm, you know, basically standing up all of the uh, sort of dependencies and resources and, and, and configuring my environment. But instead of running it locally on my machine, it is now running inside of a, a, a container, right? And so this looks, you know, uh, fairly familiar to, you know, it should feel fairly familiar and like, just like if I was working locally, because I kind of am, except I'm just doing it inside of a container. Right? Um, so with that said, let me kind of show you the data, right? Um, so the data itself, there's nothing particularly interesting. There's things that you, uh, you know, that just make sense here, but let me just kind of scroll, sorry. I'm having a hard time here the monitor. Uh, but just let me scroll up to the top here to give you an idea of what the data looks like. And so, in terms of the data, you have, you know, sort of links, you have titles, right? You have the year that this uh, particular um, movie, and I think there's TV shows here as well. Um, it was released, how long it runs, genre, you know, scores, stars. And then I believe that this one's a gross revenue here, right? Um, so great. Now we want to do something with it. I don't necessarily need all of this data. This is not particularly interesting, but 
what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to be taking the CSV, reading the, the CSV itself, and then doing some processing on top of that. Now, in this case, uh, just kind of take a step back. Uh, I'm using the Azure OpenAI SDK. Now, the naming of this could be a little bit of a misnomer because you think you see Azure AI OpenAI and you're like, oh, well, this only works with Azure. Uh, but actually, no, like this works with both ad the Azure OpenAI service as well as just you know plain uh, OpenAI. Um, in this case, I just happen to be using Azure OpenAI. And the reason that I'm using that, oh, and by the way, this might seem a little bit weird, uh, this sort of syntax here. This is a syntax inside of, uh, you know, sort of polyglot and just scripting environments that you use in .NET for referencing packages. So basically what this does is whenever I say, you know, go to NuGet, right? If you remember from the earlier slides, that's where, you know, our packages are hosted. This is going to be a NuGet package that you're going to be installing specifically CSV Helper and Azure OpenAI. And this is the specific version that I want you to install, right? And this is just saying like, hey, I'm making a reference to this package. So this is gonna go out, it's gonna download the package, install it for you, and now you can start using it um, you know, inside of your notebook. And so in this case, the reason that I'm using uh, the Azure OpenAI service is so that I can generate embeddings, right? And so in this case, I'm just using uh, Ada, right? The Ada model, Ada 2, I believe, uh, still not using Ada 3, but using the Ada 2 model, to go and generate embeddings for this. And so this is not particularly interesting. The way that I'm embedding this is uh, basically I'm using micro data formats, um, right? So if you're familiar with sort of semantic web and RDF and stuff like that, um, that's kind of where this is coming from, the schema.org set of um, uh, schemas, right, or contracts. And in this case, because I'm talking about a movie, I'm embedding information like the series title, the genre, and the overview, right? And this is the text that I'm gonna embed for each of these movies. Right. And whenever I'm done, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, if we just kind of take a look at what that looks like, right? It's just, this is the data, uh, Shawshank Redemption, 1994, all the things that we, we got from the CSV, um, as well as the embedding, right? And so again, most folks should be already familiar with this. This is just your standard 1536 ADA uh, sort of set of embeddings. Uh, and then once I have that, I just go ahead and save that to a JSON file. And so that's my movie embedding.json, which I will open anyway. Uh, give it a second, right? And so it's just a different way to represent this and save it so that I don't have to keep computing the embeddings every single time, right? So again, not really interesting, but just quick intro to Polyglot and sort of some of the data processing that I did for later using it down in, in downstream tasks like a movie recommendations uh, sort of scenario here, right? And so um, it, in the movie recommendations notebook, right? What you're going to see is it's going to look very familiar. Um, the difference is that we're introducing a few more packages here where you're introducing Melvis client. So that is the SDK, right? For, for Melvis. Um, we also have Microsoft ML. Uh, I'll kind of explain that a little bit later, but this is the ML.net set of libraries, right? And then we have Plotly.net for plotting and visualizations. And again, same process, going to NuGet, getting the package, installing it, and now it's ready to be used inside of my, uh, uh, my notebook. And so in this case, again, instead of using the, you know, computing the embeddings, I'm just going to use that movie embeddings.json file. Remember the one that we had here. And I'm just going to load that in. Uh, let me kind of get rid of this here. Um, OK. So again, should look fairly familiar. There's our movie data, and then there's our embeddings. Now, the thing is that I don't necessarily need everything. Um, in this case, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be basically ingesting data. Um, I don't need all the data. I just need some, some of it, right? And the part that I'm mostly interested in are our embeddings. <clears throat> now, I mentioned that uh, I wanted to do some sort of visualization, right? And I mentioned that I brought in uh, ML.NET for, for this. Right? I, brought, I brought in Plotly as well as ML.NET to do some of these things. Now, the reason why both of those I'm going to be using them here is number one is uh, it's really hard to visualize uh, 1,500 dimensions, right? And so it's pretty easy to sort of see it in the context of a two-dimensional sort of plot, right? And so what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to be doing a little bit of uh, dimensionality reduction, right, in a super naive way, just using uh, PCA for this, uh, Principal Component Analysis. And I'm going to be reducing the dimensions down to two, right? So it fits nicely into this uh, sort of X, X Y uh, sort of plane. Um, and so in order to do that, I'm going to go ahead and use uh, ML.NET. And so I'm going to load uh, into what we, in ML.NET, we call it a data view. You can just think of it as a way to represent uh, data, right? And we can see if we take a look at the schema here, we have both the title, 
uh, and the embedding, which is again, it's a vector of uh, size uh, 1536, right? Vector of loads. And then in this case, we're applying a transformation to our data and we're saying, hey, take the embeddings, right? The embedding, embedding column. And I want you to output it to another column. This is, you can think of it like a data frame, right? It's sort of you know, a table, if you will. Um, and then we want, uh, I want you to project this or perform PCA on top of this. Right? And you're gonna reduce it down to two dimensions. Right? So that's the dimensionality reduction I was talking about. Once you define this transformation, you go ahead and apply it. Um, and then we sort of get the data out, right, to be able to plot it. And so what you can see here is uh, we're using plotly.net in this case, right, inside of our notebook. Um, and we're plotting both components, right, the, the, the set of components that it deemed were relevant and captured, you know, the variance. So if you're familiar with you know, PC endos techniques, I'm not going to go into the details of them, but we, you know, you can read on that on, on, on your own um, time. But you're going to start to see some interesting relationships. You can't really see anything here, but if you see, for example, um, if we look in this uh, sort of top left quadrant, you can see things like Raiders of the Lost Ark, you can see Star Trek, you can see Star Wars, so Lord of the Rings. So these are more of sort of these, these epics, right? And these sort of, uh, what do you call them? Universes, right? That these movies belong to. And you can see that, you know, semantically speaking and using sort of these embeddings, you can see that there are relationships there that you can kind of tease out, right? Um, you can also see down here, you have these, uh, you know, mostly it seems like mostly French, but there are more sort of like, you know, foreign films, if you will, right? And that's sort of at the bottom here. Um, somewhere in here, you see, all out, is that the show? No, these are more sort of action movies, right? If you will, I don't know if Die Hard is a Christmas movie or not. I will let you debate that in the chat as to whether it is or not. Um, but again, right, the, the point of this visualization is like, how is my data represented more or less? And again, the, the thing with embeddings and you know what they represent is um, you, you know, they things are semantically related or not. And, and again, right, I can't tell you exactly what you know these components are per se, but you can see that there are some some patterns that that relate here, right? So that's kind of what's happening here. All right, cool. So now that I have the data, I see more or less how it is uh, structured. Um, and stuff. Now I want to go ahead and ingest that into my application, right? And so now we're going to be using the Novus client. In this case, I'm using localhost. So here's the weird part. Um, I'm going to kind of show this real quick because I always get like, um, it's exciting and weird, but it somehow works. So I mentioned to you how inside of a dev container, I am, I'm running basically my whole develop environment in a container. There's a feature that you can use inside of dev containers which lets you run Docker inside of a Docker container. <laughs> so that's kind of what's happening here. So this should be pretty familiar. You're going to notice that uh, I'm, uh, let me kind of just get out of this. You're going to notice that I'm connecting to local host, but the local host that I'm connecting to here is not like my local host. It's the Docker container acting as the local host. I believe right? the proper term for that is Dockerception. Doc <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and if, if that term is not coined, uh, you heard it here first, folks. Um, so let me see here. So this should be fairly, fairly, fairly familiar to you, right? There's this uh, standalone embedded. So I'm running the embedded version of Milvis here, right? And so if I were to do something like bash, standalone embed, start, I believe is the command, right? This is just straight out of documentation, right? Like this should feel fairly familiar for you. Um, and at this point, I'm just uh, connecting to the Melvis database at some point at the start. I probably should have started this beforehand. Uh, while that's coming up, let me kind of start going through the code. And so in this case, I'm just going to kind of like look at the collections. In this case, I'm getting this collection called movies, which I already have populated ahead of time, right, prior to this, this uh, call. Um, and you can see that if I were to sort of print out what the collections look like, um, it's sort of here, right? Um, then it's just, again, setting up that collection schema. Now, one of the things that I'm doing here is um, I'm not putting all of the data inside of the vector database, right? I'm using the vector database as a sort of uh, lookup, right? A way to find relevant semantically related terms. But my data is actually, in this case, I just, you know, faked it. I'm using sort of like an in-memory sort of collection, right? But you could imagine this being a SQL database, a NoSQL database where your data lives, right? I'm just leveraging the indexing and search capabilities of the vector DB, right, to, to pull up some, some relevant recommendations in this case for movies, right? And so because of that, the only things that I'm really worried about are a movie ID. So you could imagine this ID already being present in your original database, right? 
and the embedding itself, <clears throat> right? And so I'll go ahead and, in this case, I was creating the collection, but it's already created. Um, if you see the description here, you'll see the, right, there's movies, here's the fields, stuff like that. So this should all feel fairly familiar to you if you've, you know, you've been working with Melvis. Here's where I'm creating that, that in-memory database. And basically what I'm, uh, what I'm doing is uh, I'm just, you know, generating the indices, right? And then having information like the title and the embedding. And you're going to see here that uh, that's kind of what shows up here. So I have an enumeration here, right? The title as well as uh, the embedding. Um, okay, so let's see. Okay, so that's kind of what my in-memory database sort of representation looks like, right? Um, but into the collection that I built for movies for Melvis, the only things that I'm providing are the movie ID and uh, the movie embedding, right? And so that's what we're going to uh, ingest into our data. We can see that if we get the entity count after we have sort of, uh, uh, you know, persisted this, uh, we're going to end up with a thousand movies, you know, give or take. Um, we go ahead and create the index. We define search parameters. In this case, we want to output the movie IDs, right? Um, and in this case, again, I'm also using, uh, in this case, I'm going to be using Azure OpenAI for similar reasons, right, to also compute embeddings. But now because I'm going to be doing sort of that search or that comparison, right, uh, I want to do it not on the movies themselves, but I want to do it on whatever query I'm, you know, submitting for search. Right? So that's kind of where, again, very similar pattern. We're just creating a, a client for OpenAI, right, that lets us, you know, talk to those set of models. Same thing. Uh, we're using Ada for this. And in this case, the input is going to be, I'm looking for family-friendly movies. So out of that list of 1,000, I want to see family-friendly movies. Now, in the in the particular descriptions, right, um, if I go back to movie embeddings, right, you have this overview, right? So this is, if you remember, we used the overview, we used genre, and we used uh, uh, title, right? That's Those are the things that were embedded. So based on that information, we should be able to find semantically something that will pull up, you know, related related results here in our recommendation uh, engine. Okay, so we go through the process of generating the embeddings for um, our query, right? Family-friendly movies. And then we're just performing a search, right, against it, uh, against our collection of movies, uh, limiting it to 10. You're going to see here that uh, we go ahead and get our movie IDs um, and that's going to just produce the relevant IDs, which by themselves are not particularly useful. But when you do then a query against your database, in this case, it's our in-memory database, right? If you remember, we also had the titles as part of that. Again, it could include other information as well. Now we're using those IDs that were retrieved from the beta, from the search, uh, the vector database search, right? And now we're just, um, you know, showing you the uh, the different results, right? The titles of the movies that, that that sort of popped up here, right? And you can see Up is, that makes sense. Uh, the Incredibles makes sense. Children of Men, if I, it's the one that I'm thinking of, unless there's a children's movie. Yeah. Uh, I don't I think, think this it got, is- <laughs> It got turned around here a bit by the, the children thing, right? That's I think so. <laughs> yeah, because this is definitely not something that is family friendly, uh, but okay, so- here we see how like, you know, there are certain, you know, words or terms, right, that may influence or have higher weight in terms of how these results are generated, right? And there's various techniques for, for improving this, but in this case, right, we're keeping it super simple. It's very naive way of, of going about this, right? Um, so yeah, um, that's, that's basically, you know, how you would go about using the SDK, pairing it with some sort of database, right? In this case, we kept it super simple. It's just a JSON uh the sort of file here but in a real world application right this would be your sql database this would be your no sql store right and so on and so forth so i'm going to kind of pause there um see if there's any questions or anything um before jumping into the next section here let me just kind of go up to the top here um all right Oh yeah, this is another cool thing. So even though I'm, so there's a bunch of extensions that I installed here, um, but one of the cool things that you can also see here is, again, we can have like a whole section on this, but uh, you can see that the Milvis container is running, right? This is 2.4. So this is kind of what Shai was mentioning, even though I'm using the 2.3 version of the SDK, um, when I run against the RC, 2.4 RC, you could see that it still worked, right? Um, you know, obviously, like the new APIs, that that's a different story, and that's what Shire is working on. But um, you know, 
for if you're using it for your the already existing set of APIs and, and you know endpoints, like it works just fine. And then if I were to just so that it doesn't keep consuming resources here, I'm just gonna stop and I should see this sort of you know eventually stop. But uh, since I don't see any questions, I'm just gonna kind of like jump to the next section, which is okay, great. Um, I now have embeddings in, in my database. Um, I want to do other things with them. And so in this case, it's it's a throwback. Uh, it's Gen AI ish in the con in the con uh, sort of in the context that we are still using those embeddings, right? And the embeddings that we generated using these you know, sort of Gen AI uh, embedding layers in those you know, the, the open AI set of models. Uh, but it's a bit of a throwback to hey, we used to do um, you know things differently prior to LLMs and Gen AI, right? And so uh, there's a lot more that you can do here. So if you remember in the embeddings.json, um, we had this gross amount, and this was typically uh, the, the revenue, right, that was generated. So imagine that you wanted to, instead of, you know, generating LLM calls just to be like, hey, can you predict the gross amount for a movie, right, given some sort of inputs, right, what do you think the gross amount for whatever new movies coming out is going to be? And certainly you can use uh, generative AI to do some of this, but we've had models and we built models in the past that kind of do this for you already, right? Um, and you know, have regression models and so on and so forth. And so <clears throat> that's kind of what we're gonna be looking at. Can we build a model, right? Using your classical ML techniques, still leveraging those same embeddings that you have, you know, you generated and you, you stored in your database to now like just build this predictive model. And the thing that I'll caveat, I'll sort of, you know, um, you know, uh, the sort of give away the punchline here at the end is this is not a very good model because we have only a thousand entries. And part of the, you know, working with these models, it's experimenting, like, you know, does this feature have more of an impact on, uh, you know, and, and things like that. But so with that away, let's just for illustration purposes, how would you go about doing something like that? And so in this case, <clears throat> you're going to see that I'm still using that ML set of packages, but I'm using auto ML in this case, right? And if you're not familiar with auto ML, it's basically um there's part of it is sort of like patterns um but also strategies for op choosing the best model the best hyperparameters for your data set right and typically when you go and train these models from scratch there are things that you have to, just like when you're building gen ai solutions there are things that you have to think about like you know what does my data look like what you know features or inputs am i going to provide in order to generate good responses or generate good predictions from this model right uh, which, you know, which algorithm I'm going to use. Like, that's not really a concern with Gen AI, right? But even in Gen AI, you still have to think about, like, you know, for example, like, which embedding am I going to use, right? And so I think, you know, part of the, part of the um, sort of uh, some of the challenges here in building a good model is not only is there not enough data, but also it's possible that the embedding models that were used may not have been appropriate for, you know, for this particular use case, right? And so there's all these considerations that you kind of have to think about. And then once you sort of choose an algorithm, you have to be like, okay, well, you know, how, what are the hyperparameters? So in the Gen AI space, right, you can think of those as like my temperature, my top K, you know, top P, like those types of things that you set that they're not necessarily influencing, you know, they're not built in uh, sort of to the model, but they are sort of guidelines, right, that help the model generate answers. And so in classical ML, it's very much the same concept, right? But what if you could automate that, right? It's like, go here's my data go figure out what you need to go do to then provide me with the best responses right and that's kind of what automel is doing here um except it's more sort of geared towards the traditional uh uh sort of the classical ML scenarios right and so i'm using automel here um again nothing particularly interesting just loading that json data that i had right i could be just bringing it because i'm only going to be using the embeddings anyway uh for this case but if I wanted to, right, I could load this directly from the Milpas database. Um, again, this looks very similar to what you saw before. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do some data transformation, right, because I only want the gross uh, and the embeddings, right? Gross is the thing, remember, that I'm trying to predict. And then the embeddings, that contains the information, like the description of the movie and things like that. If I were to go and try to sort of, you know, really build a solution around this, right? I might also consider adding things like, you know, the IMDB rating or the meta score or additional information that would help inform this prediction. But in this case, I kept it super simple. Just use the information in the embeddings to try to tease out what you think the gross amount will be, right? And we're going to provide some historical data for that. 
Um, again, we load into this this data view. We have the embeddings and our, <clears throat> and our gross amount, which is just uh, again, right? This is just a, a number. Right? We go through the same sort of steps here. Where uh, or, you know, if you've done classical ML before, this should look very familiar to you. Train test split. You uh, you use some of your data for training. Use some of your data for testing. Right. And the thing here, what you're trying to avoid is you're trying to basically uh, avoid overfitting, right? Which is this common problem where um, the, the way that I like to describe it is like, imagine if you were studying for a test and you knew the answers ahead of time, right? And so you go and you take the test and like you memorize the answers. And so now that you memorize the answers, you go and you get like the highest marks, right? And you're like, oh my God. He really knows his stuff. It's like, no, 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 I memorize the answers, right? If you were to like maybe ask about, you know, ask me questions that were not part of, you know, the sort of cheat sheet that I memorized, right? I may not do as well, right? And so that's kind of what we're trying to avoid here. We're trying to avoid the model memorizing the answers, right? And actually learn the patterns, right? Rather than just, again, memorizing the answers. And so that's why we're, you know, leaving some data out um, and only training on a subset. So remember how we had a thousand, now we're only using 800 to train our model. And then 20%, that's kind of what this test fraction is. 20%, we're going to use it for uh, uh, for testing, right? And then data that it's the model's never seen before to see, is this model actually good at you know generalizing um, the gross amounts here? Here's where AutoML comes in. All I need to tell it is like, hey, what are you trying to predict? And what's going to be the inputs? And this is, I'm just saying, I don't want you to use light GPM. This is one set of, you know, uh, algorithms that you can use right? and that's all i tell them. i'm like hey i just want to do regression and regression in this case is just like predict a number right and i want to predict gross which is a number uh and then i go about just creating an experiment i'm like hey use my training set here's the pipeline that i want you to use which is really just a regression set and what you know even though this looks simple under the hood it's doing all the things that we talked about like choosing the hyperparameters choosing the algorithms like going through that exploration process for you so you don't have to do it yourself. Uh, you know, telling it, hey, what is the thing that I'm optimizing for? And in this case, it's gonna be the mean absolute error, right? So there's different metrics that you can use. Um, this is just some boilerplate code so that it spits out, like as it's going through the training process, it spits something out to the console. You can actually get a lot, do a lot better than this. But in here, I'm just literally doing like a dump of the logs. Um, which once you start it, it kind of looks like this, right? It's like, you know, I'm starting a trial, I'm going, you know, doing various things, so on and so forth. Um, but then in the end, you end up with a model. And you're going to see here, if I kind of inspect what this model looks like, you're going to see that it shows the fast tree algorithm regression model, right, for this particular use case. Um, if I then go and do, you know, look at the predictions, now notice that I'm not using the training set, I'm using the tester, right? So this is the thing that, you know, we didn't really, uh, uh, we left out, right? And if I were to kind of just look at this, predictions not this way, this work. Uh, let's see, input schema, output schema. Uh, oh, sorry, it's a preview. Okay, so if we look at the preview, um, we can see here, you know, okay, so here's our embedding, here's our gross, right? Um, here's our, our, our gross value. And then if we were to, oh, interesting that they, they fit it this way. But essentially we should be able to see is like, this is the, you know, the actual, and then this is the predicted value, right? And how it computes the metrics is by sort of like, uh, you know, comparing like how far off am I between my predicted value and my actual value? Um, which when we run an evaluation for these predictions, right, here's where what you end up with. And you can see that these metrics are actually horrible. Like you typically your R squared, right? Uh, how well it fits. You would want this to be, you know, first of all, a positive number, hopefully. Uh, and you would want this to be, you know, up towards like closer to one, right? And this is not the only metric we're actually optimizing for. Mean square, but you can see that in the mean square, this just is like through the roof, right? So this is a, a pretty, pretty poor model that, again, right, if we played around with the inputs that we use, if we played around with, um, uh, you know, the algorithms that we chose, maybe if we introduce like GBM as, a, as an algorithm, right, it might do better, right? So there's a, a bunch of different things that we could play with at this point. But the main takeaway here is that it's like, okay, well, with, you can go and build uh, and leverage embeddings for, you know, building rag style applications. However, the, and, 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 you know, vector databases play an important role in that. 
right? Uh, especially like finding relevance and retrieving relevant results. But there's so much more that you can do, right? And but using the same set of you know SDKs and patterns and things like that, you can build other types of solutions like recommendation engines, right? Um, you can also use these embeddings, pull them from you know your vector store, correlate them with additional data sources, right? To build these sort of predictive models that you know this is not going to be your you know sort of GPT quality uh, style of responses, right? But it's cheap. Like honestly, uh, so if you take a look, how long it took to train uh oh i guess i can see that yeah it took like three minutes right for me to train this uh go try to fine tune uh <laughs> in three minutes right so it's like it's it's just the, the main takeaway here is that there's different approaches and that you know uh leveraging vector stores and embeddings right you can build really compelling solutions beyond you know sort of your chatbot so with that i'm going to kind of pause here let me see uh, I'm going to kind of pause here, and that's basically the end of our demos uh, for now. Um, one of the things that I kind of call out here is when we're talking about uh, sort of the, the uh, movie recommendation example, you're going to notice that I did a lot of this sort of uh, by hand, right? The search async, and I'm using the lower level sort of set of APIs. Um, with semantic kernel, right? A lot of this is just sort of wrapped for you, right? And so instead of me going through through this, you know, very manual process, right? There's a set of abstractions just for doing search. There's a set of abstractions that help you with doing rag, that that significantly shrink down this code, right? And, and instead of me having to, you know, go through these all these configurations for my OpenAI uh, embedding model, right? There's a few set of abstractions in the kernel that that make this a relatively trivial process. Yeah, that, that's that's an important point that that we said before as well. There's there's a question of which level you want to work on, right? Like how low level you want to be. Just like with a traditional database, you can be coding SQL like at a low level, or you can be using an ORM that does a lot more stuff for you. Um, and that that's great that you have this choice. In this world, we also have that choice. Uh, so you can you can work directly like Luis just showed with a low level uh, driver directly with Milvis and do you know um, do the 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 and the upserts and do the uh, you know the similarity search yourself like. Very very much like manually, or you can go at a higher level, which is what a lot of people are going to end up doing at the, at the same time, right? Um, and, and, you know, do use something that basically ties these components for you and already takes care of a lot of code. Like a lot of the stuff that we do is also to try to make the minimal hello world kind of AI app very much sh like as short as possible so that you don't have to write like swaths screens of code just in order to get something working. That's something we work on a lot, but it's always important to layer, you know, to have this clear separation between layers so that if you do want to drop down to the low level API for whatever reason your application you know presents, you can always do that. That's always very, very important, right? To have you to have that choice. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Um, thank you guys for this presentation um, and the demos. I think we are running up on the end of our time here. Um, if there's any questions, we can kind of wait around for a couple couple minutes or so, see if there's any questions that pop up. But otherwise, um, I think uh, this is a, a good uh, a good wrap. Yes, and speaking of stuff, uh, if you want to learn more, <laughs> uh, it would have been, uh, so uh, thank you, Yushin, for dropping the Nougat package, right? Uh, you sh there should be a link to the repo there as well. The documents yeah. are on the Milvis website uh, as well for how to use the, the SDK specifically. But if you're looking more for like, you know, higher level, like getting started resources, this includes, you know, semantic kernel and how you would use semantic kernel in the context of these types of applications as well, just more broad uh sort of like getting started resources for AI and .NET. You can check out these links here. Um, and, and yeah, uh, give us feedback, uh, let us know, and then, you know, we'd be happy to work with you all to, you know, make the, exper the experience in .NET, right, uh, re a really great experience, and more importantly, help you be productive. All right, it doesn't look like there's any questions that came in, so thank you everybody who uh, came and showed up, and thank you, Luis and Shai, for coming and giving this uh, wonderful presentation. And Sweet. For those of you who are watching, um, you know, feel free to use any of these links and uh, we'll have another workshop next week, same time. All awesome. right, guys. Thanks for having us.
Thank you very much. Have a good one. Bye.